Welcome to Katie Draws. This is where I talk about goddesses, mythology, or folk tales, and I draw them at the same time. One of my followers asked if I could do Lilith today, the most infamous demoness in the entire world. Most of us probably are familiar with her, so that is what we're going to be talking about in this video. Make sure to stop by my socials at Katie Draws on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, etc., and on my Patreon if you want some sneak peeks or previews of Goddesses, Folktales, Mythology, make sure to subscribe. Now sit back, relax, let's talk about Lilith. Lilith has been a part of our pantheon and in a lot of our folktales for a really long time, over 4,000 years in fact. She has stories that are quite controversial. Some people do not agree on some of the things, but then we have stories that people do agree on. Lilith has gone from a lowly demoness, hardly anybody to note, not really that scary, just more of a nuisance. And then she went to be, in fact, the first wife of the first man ever to be made, then to be a succubus. She's been a vampire. She's been all kinds of stuff. She it, has also become one of the most powerful demons ever. So she's gone up in the world. I'm hoping I can do the same. In fact, a lot of the feminist movement celebrates her because she represents independence from the patriarchy. So really, she's grown a lot. Lilith represents chaos, seduction, obviously evil. From the roots of her name, she's been mostly dangerous. You probably shouldn't be messing with her. So the Sumerian word for female de demons or wind spirits is actually called Lilitu, and that root word is just the equivalent to being a demon, a female demon. One of the earliest times that Lilith appears is actually in Gilgamesh, and it's a story specifically about the Hulupu tree. It's a Sumerian epic poem. This was actually written in 2000 BC. For those of you that don't know Gilgamesh, he is one of the first heroes written about, one of the most epic of heroes. He kills lots of monsters. In this story with Gilgamesh, he is trying to assist the goddess Inanna, who's actually the goddess of love and war. So her home, her garden, is near the Euphrates River, and she tends to this willow tree, or also called the Hulupu tree. She wants to craft the wood from this tree to be a throne and a bed for herself, but she realizes there is this dragon nest inside, and there's this zoo bird, and the demoness Lilith has built her house in here. This is very upsetting to Inanna. She is not okay with this. Gilgamesh comes in, it takes care of all these creatures inside this tree, these evil creatures, and Lilith flees into the desert. Something to keep in mind as far as metaphors go, forests, barren lands, those kinds of things, especially being punished in those ways, sent out into these areas, usually means something to do with the natural chaos. We as humans fear those places because of the disorder, the natural disorder of nature. So there's a hint of fear associated with it. It also kind of represents that opposition to the masculine order. So we have Lilith being the feminine chaos. We do have some representations of Lilith. Some people believe this is actually Inanna or other goddesses during that time, but we do believe that Lilith has wings. She has the talons of a bird, probably like an owl. She is like a bird of prey and has a lot of those representation like glowing eyes. She is described having horns or illustrated this way. Some believe that there's a crown of horns covering or encompassing all of her hair. Lilith is also described kind of like a screeching owl, really similar to a harpy. She is a demon. She is a creature of the darkness. She is also incredibly beautiful. Throughout history, we even have pieces of Old Testaments in the Bible 
that the Israelites were really familiar with Lilith. She was a really well-known demon up to the 8th century BC. In the King James Version of the Bible, it actually states in Isaiah 34, 14, wild cats shall meet hyenas, goat demons shall greet each other. There too the Lilith shall repose and find herself a resting place. This also can translate into the screech owl. We're going back to those bird qualities. And not only that, we have a night hag that translated or a night monster or whatever you want. Now, between the times that the Talmud is being written, Lilith is very much a powerful figure, powerful dark figure to the point that we have proof that there are inscriptions or ceramic bowls with spells on them to detour Lilith from snatching babies or husbands, sometimes if she did copulate with somebody at night. Without these spells, the people would give birth to strange, depraved offspring. But where Lilith actually became more dark and more powerful was during the Middle Ages. So prior to the year 1000, there is this text called the Alphabet of Ben Syra. It includes a story about Lilith. So she's the same destructive, promiscuous, dark demon, but she's also the wife of Adam. So this is how the story actually goes. Adam and Lilith were both formed of the same earth, the same clay. So therefore Lilith understandably says that they are equal. Where it became problematic for them was during sex. She wanted to be on top. Some people don't necessarily think it translates 100% to sex or just in general she deserves to be on top and not just on the bottom. But Adam refuses to believe this. He says that a woman should always be on the bottom. Now Lilith is like, nah dude, I want equality. And you know why? We are both made of the same clay, the same shit. So they're arguing. They're not getting along. So finally, Lilith utters the most powerful and sacred name of God. She rose into the air and flew away to the Red Sea. Potentially, Lilith is engaging in all kinds of sexual promiscuity to a point where she's actually bearing more than a hundred demon children a day. God decides <laughs> we can't be doing this. So he sends three angels down to her to stop her shit. So they threaten to drown her and she says no because she was created in order to weaken the babes. If it is a male, I have power over him from the moment of his birth until the eighth day of his life. And this is a time where he should be circumcised, by the way. And if it's a girl, I have her until the 20th day. So the angels, instead of drowning her, decided to try to compromise with her. They decide that if any of the children, any of the babes, are wearing a particular protective amulet that feature any of the angels or any other protective spell against Lilith, she can't go near them. And she said, sure, fine. And she also consented to the death of a hundred of her own children, day after day after day, every single day. We also have some other information that may or may not be true. Scholars disagree on this particular point. There's a time where Lilith is actually a little jealous. She kind of misses Adam, but you know, hate misses. And she wants to get back with him again. So she transforms into the snake. She lures Eve because she can't lure Adam because they're both equal. They both come from the same earth. Now, Eve, on the other hand, is subservient. She is more powerful than Eve. So she convinces Eve to eat the apple out of spite. Lilith, for a period of time, ends up becoming just a child-killing sex fiend demon. One to be feared. This lasted a really, really long time. But Lilith became even more powerful. Speaking of the snake in the Garden of Eden, we have another character that is actually mentioned as well, Samael. Now, again, some people disagree on this, but Samael is supposed to be an archangel in Talmudic lore. He is a heavenly host, but he technically is fairly destructive. 
Some people think that he's actually fallen from God. But anyway, so Samael and Lilith may have become partners. We do have some scripts that talk about Samael and his spouse, and some people believe that his spouse is actually Lilith. Samael is supposed to be like one of the biggest demons in Jewish tradition. Lilith has gone over many, many transformations. This winged night creature is probably the only she-demon from the Babylonian Empire that still exists, and she keeps reviving and changing and surviving. The reason for this is because she kind of embodies that independence of women, the changing role of women. So here's where we get into, into the modern day view of Lilith. Because Lilith rejects the fact that she needs to be subservient and leaves this bountiful garden, she has become almost a icon to the feminist movement because she wants to be free to do what she wants, independent, including having a sexual appetite. That's totally fair. Not only that, but Lilith has played a lot of roles in our pop culture. She has been in books, TV, video games, anime, manga, all kinds of stuff. So for instance, we have obviously Diablo series, which features Lilith. We have Castlevania, again, any vampire masquerade game features Lilith. We have Stargate Atlantis, the Chronicles of Narnia, the Marvel Universe, even Lilu from the Fifth Element is supposed to be an embodiment of Lilith. She's been in all kinds of things. People love her. They're very curious about her. And she's survived this long, 4,000 years of time. I guess we'll see what she turns into next. This is a very basic overview of who Lilith is. She is by far more complicated than I have given her credit, but that could be a video that lasts hours. You can find more information about her in the description down below in my citations for more stuff. It'll get you started at the very least. If you like my art, come follow me at Katie Draws on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, etc. Also, make sure to join my Patreon if you want to contribute and let me know what kind of goddesses you want to learn about. You can find that over there. You can also subscribe down below, give me a like, and all of the things so you know when all my videos come live. Keep watching if you really enjoy folk tales and art. There's a whole slew of videos right here. Enjoy, I'll see you next time.